Welcome back to the Energy Sovereignty Project. For those of you just joining us, the Energy Sovereignty Project is an examination of what a solar home of the future will look like once the technology becomes less expensive and more readily available. So we're in the middle of a year-long examination as to how far this can actually go with capacities and, and, and uh, solar generation that is sufficient to actually make this, uh, make this possible. So six months on, where are we? Those that have been following along with us from the beginning have seen the excitement of the install and the early periods where we were learning the system's capabilities and, and limitations and then finally settling in to see how the seasons affect not only the system overall but how we interact with the system and uh, make it perform for us throughout the year. So because we've gone from solar minimum to solar maximum now, we have seen most of the variations that the year will throw our way. And I expect that we'll see some seasonal variations as the hibernal season that we'll enter into in October doesn't exactly mirror that vernal season that we had in early spring. So there'll be some differences there. And then also where we are just south of Sacramento, California, the temperatures in late July and through August tend to be rather elevated and that will lead to some situations where we won't have the cooling that we have in the evening so we won't be able to ventilate the home as well as the fact that the um, solar panels don't perform at peak efficiency when the temperatures outside get over 108, 110 degrees, they, they can really start to lose their efficiency. And then obviously as well as the additional AC use. But let's take a look at what we have so far. And so we'll start with an overview of the year. And uh, that's our energy use there. As of July the 1st, uh, our home uh, usage has been just under 7 megawatts. For the uh, for the year uh, and uh, seven megawatt hours, and the total production has been just over seven megawatt hours, and in that time period, we have had to draw 511 kilowatt hours from the grid, and we've managed to contribute 206 kilowatt hours to the grid. And when it's graphed out, <clears throat> looks like this. That gives us a good representation of how the seasons affect what what happens to the system and it gives us uh, an, uh, an opportunity to quite nicely see to what degree the batteries are utilized at any period of, uh, of the year and so uh, we also have a graph that shows us what has uh, happened with the system as a matter of percentage <clears throat> now this graph is especially useful here at the six month mark because these are percentages and because of that we'll basically see a mirroring of this in the remainder of the year and as that plays out these percentages aren't really going to change so it'll likely represent our annual results so we'll see how close we come to that at the end of the year now obviously the power walls aren't actually producing power and all the power you see here is solar power except obviously that bit that was drawn from the grid uh, but uh, um, the 52.9 percent of the power wall percentage represents the amount of stored solar power that was then delivered back to the home and the best way to think of this is to remember back to our duck curve video if we didn't have batteries, we would have sent 4,875 kilowatts out to the grid and then drawn that power back. And instead of doing this, we reduced that 4.8 megawatt hours out the grid to just 206 kilowatt hours. And that is how you solve the duck curve. So, what we have here is that during the daylight hours through the year, 40.7% of the sunlight was directly consumed by the home while the sun was shining, and then 52.9% of that power was stored in the batteries for home use in the evening or was drawn out to power the car. And the benefit 
to us, aside from making our power bill a whole lot easier to understand, was that we got to use this power locally. And because we used the power locally, we got a better understanding of what our home usage, what our power usage actually is. What appliances, as you turn them on, because you can see the app in real time, you'll be able to see which appliances add what amount of consumption to your power throughout the day. Very uh, handy. And also, we got an opportunity then to exercise our energy sovereignty to immunize us from rolling blackouts and also to a great deal from the fuel pump, as you'll see a little bit later on in this video. So, uh, this did come at a cost, however, and I don't mean just a financial cost. Let's have another look at that first chart again. So, Straight away, you notice something funny. We produced 7,177 kilowatt hours of uh, solar power, and we used 69 or 6,951 kilowatt hours. So, shouldn't our from the grid percentage be zero? Well, to get a more comprehensive look at where this power went, I'm going to be doing a separate video where we will examine in detail the breakdown component by component and try and see where these losses went because they, they stack up. But for the sake of this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at all of those losses as a whole and then identify our uh, primary culprit. So to start off with, when looking at the power used by the home compared to the solar produced, the first thing that's important to remember is that the lion's share of our usage was in winter. And that's important because we weren't producing much power. And this time of the year, that's all shifted. Now we're at a situation where we're generating much more power than the, uh, than the home is, is using. We're offsetting some of that by, by driving. And again, that's what brought that direct use percentage up a little bit. But what I'm saying here is, is that the home usage compared to the power created uh, is interesting information, but it's not really all of that, all that useful when you're trying to decide um, the efficiency of, the, uh, of the, the total system. And again, that's because of the fact that we're drawing most of the energy when we're not producing it. So that uh, muddies the water a little bit. The real interesting numbers to me are the in and out of the power walls. For the purpose of what you see here, the losses are all related to the power wall. As we see from the previous chart, we got 40.7% of our power straight from solar. And what that means is that 40.7% of the power didn't touch the power wall. The power was directly consumed by the home as it was generated at a loss of only 2.4% that we got from our primary inverter. Now, again, when I do my next video on the individual components and the losses, we'll go more into how I got that, uh, uh, that percentage uh, uh, number. But the important thing is, is that those PV losses from the primary inverter aren't even reflected in that 7,177 kilowatt hour produced number because all of those losses, the 2.4% the uh, uh, losses, all occurred before we even got that number. So, I mean, discount that. And uh, so, again, like I'm saying, the primary losses that we're seeing in the system are from the power wall. The power into the power wall through its built-in rectifier, the power out of the power wall through its built-in inverter, and then, finally, power loss through housekeeping. The power walls run a coolant loop and fans, and the power wall too works in exactly the same way as the batteries in the Tesla automobiles. They, obviously, like I said, they run that coolant loop while charging and, and discharging themselves to keep the batteries at an optimal temperature to make sure that they extend the life of the batteries to that 20 year mark. This has a result, however, creating what is known in the Tesla automotive community as vampire losses. What I can't say is how long the system would retain a charge if somebody just 
left a power wall dormant because we don't do that. It's likely in that situation that the power wall would actually maintain the charge for a very long period of time. But our system gets used. It gets worked hard, especially when I charge the car. Whenever I charge the car, I can hear those coolant fans coming on, so I know that we're uh, running, the, uh, running the coolant loop. So let's calculate out our actual loss as an aggregate of all power wall losses. Again, we're not going to try and tease anything out just yet. We'll save that for another video. And the easiest way to do that is to look at those in and out numbers from the power wall. We sent 4,669 kilowatt hours to the, uh, to the power wall and we pulled out 3,879. So at the time all of this data was compiled on July 1st, the batteries were, nears makes no difference, 100% charged. And that gives us a solid validated 80 kilowatt hours. So in the name of fairness, we'll go ahead and add that to our total to give us uh, 3,959 kilowatt hours out. Well, that gives us a round trip loss of 15.2%. Now, I was expecting closer to 10%. That's uh, what we get from uh, Tesla's data sheet. When we do our video on the actual losses on the component level, I'll tease out exactly where these losses are occurring, whether they're occurring as the power goes into the power walls or as they come out of the power walls. And hopefully what that will allow us to do is to give us an idea of how to optimize the use of the system to minimize those losses as, as we go. It may come out to be that we just need to uh, 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 use the system and not worry about it. But we'll see. Tesla's data sheet, again, like I said, showed a round trip efficiency of 90%. And, and that may actually be accurate, but until I get that data back from, the, from our loss testing, I'm not going to know how much we're seeing is recording error or because of vampire losses in the system due to that housekeeping that I was telling about. But uh, going by these raw numbers, it's, it, it seems that we're about 5.2% over what uh, Tesla lists in their data sheet. But again, until we finish all that testing, it's just too early to place the blame directly on the power walls, especially when early on, we were really kind of messing with the system as we were trying to figure it out. And it may very well be that those early tests that we were conducting may have uh, played a, a role in reducing those uh, efficiency numbers. But the fact remains that we lost 790 kilowatt hours to the batteries and so then we can assume in a worst case scenario over the remainder of the year we're going to lose 1580 kilowatt hours and so let's close this out with some fun stuff so driving on sunlight so uh, 5002 miles that's well on track to give us over 10,000 miles this year on nothing but sunlight. That's 833 bucks that I didn't spend at our local gas station. I drove by to check the, uh, uh, the price of gas over there. And that's a projected annual savings if I were to spend that in, in gasoline, 1,600 bucks or more. So that's not inconsequential. And, but that's the good news. But remember, you're here watching this because you want to get all of the information. Well, in order to do that, we have to remember and take a quick look at how far we did not go on sunlight. And so on the first of the year, I reset my trip meter. And though the starting odometer reading isn't recorded in the master log, the car has traveled a total of 7,678.2 miles and used a total of 2,513.6 kilowatt hours to do so. That gave us a, a rating of 32.7 kilowatts for every 100 miles driven. And so, uh, 2,675.7 miles, or if a better way to look at it is 875 kilowatt hours of power that we have to either pull off the grid or find elsewhere. If we were to pay uh, for that in winter rates, this power would cost us an additional $84.78. Uh, our current winter rates are uh, uh, about... Uh, uh, Little, uh, little under 10 cents a kilowatt hour. 
And because of this being our sixth month, we can then project our total out of pocket to drive 15,356 miles this year at $170. And finally, our projected cost to run the Energy Sovereignty Project home for one year and drive 15,356 miles, 230 bucks. Less than someone might spend in gasoline in a month. And that should put a smile on anyone's face. Well, that's it, six months running six power walls. Hope you found that interesting. Uh, we'll be, as I said, bringing a couple more videos here shortly with uh, teasing out all of the losses that are in the system. We'll also be doing a special on driving on sunlight, seeing what the efficiencies are of our vehicle from roof to wheels. And uh, of course, our weekly updates will keep coming. So again, thanks for stopping in. Good luck with your own systems and we'll see you soon.